Hello, welcome to Guide London. My name is Nick Salmond. I'm a London Blue Badge Tourist Guide and one of many members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides. That's the organisation behind the Guide London website. Now, this is the latest in our series of broadcasts that we've, bringing you, we've been bringing you for about 10 months now, bringing you a little bit of London into your home because, of course, we're not allowed out into the streets at the moment to do our usual guiding. Hopefully, when the pandemic is over, you'll all come and see us in London. But in the meantime, we'll try and bring a little bit of London to you. And if you um, are interested in the city, then go and have a look at some of the broadcasts we've been doing over the last few months. You'll find broadcasts on all sorts of things from the great buildings here, like St Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, the Tower of London. Uh, we've talked about areas of London. We've talked about some of the famous people who've lived here, like Charles Dickens. All our previous broadcasts you can find on our YouTube channel. Just search for Guide London or on Facebook. Now today we've got a slightly different broadcast for you in that we're not going to concentrate on just one particular part of London. We're going to take as our theme today the board game Monopoly. Now if you've ever played Monopoly and especially if you played the London edition you'll be very familiar with some of the street names in the capital here. But do you know more about the streets. What about what did they look like? What are the interesting facts associated with those streets? Well, I'm delighted to introduce to you today London Blue Badge Tourist Guide, Rick Jones. Rick has devised a special virtual tour that takes you round the Monopoly board, landing on the squares and telling you a little bit about some of the places that you land on. Um, and so Rick is going to give us a little taste of that virtual tour today and tell us a little bit of the history of the game as well. We are broadcasting live, so if you've got any questions about Monopoly or about London in general, just put them in the comments and we will try and answer them before the end of the programme. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Rick, who's going to tell us all about the London Monopoly board. Rick. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. And um, hello, everybody else. And welcome to this... Um, a uh, tour of the Monopoly board. It's It functions in a way as an introduction to London because the streets on the Monopoly board chosen uh, were uh, are, are some of the most famous streets in London. But um, I'll, I'll uh, explain that as we go along. I'll give you an introduction. This is the introductory, um, the int introduction that I give to the talk when it takes place, which um, is every day at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, twice a day. Not, a, not all the tours are full and if, they, if no one comes then it doesn't take place, but those are the scheduled times. Good day to everyone and welcome to this tour of the Monopoly board in virtual reality. I be the guide, Rick Jones, my blue badge here, tells you I can lead you where you wish to go in London even through the back streets of the great metropolis. Now, clearly there's no chance of getting lost on the Monopoly board, so I'll fulfil my other role and keep you entertained with tales about the places where we stop. We'll not get round the whole lot in an hour, and so, as in the game, the dice dictate. It's fun to have an element of chance, plus it means no two tours are the same. As you may know, it's based on property and what it's worth to put up houses and hotels in different parts. You lie back and let the rent pour in, living off the capital, Das Kapital, as Karl Marx with irony had named his book. Property is theft, he wrote, Eigentum ist Diebstahl. We'll come back to him. The capital's the money earned by not a stroke of work, except for maintenance, repairing radiators, painting walls and fixing leaky showers, especially if you've students in. You are the landlord or landlady, profiting from property. Monopoly was called the landlord's game when people played it first, and that was in 1903. It was created in the USA by game inventor Liz Magee of Brentwood, Maryland, and there she is. She was a feminist, and once she advertised herself as wife and slave to make a point. She always aimed to educate. She was the daughter of a journalist who toured with Lincoln on the campaign trail and was a fervent advocate of what was called the single tax movement, which held that there should only be one tax 
and that was all on property, not work. Her game took off with students who delighted in the thrill of bankrupting their friends, although they also learnt of an alternative to capitalist theory, as Magie's invention had a second part she called prosperity, where ownership was taxed, and players learned how wealth could be amassed when they cooperated as a team. The students played the game with their own streets from various towns in North America, which weakened Magie's exclusivity and left her open to unscrupulous and wily players in the corporate field. In fact, for many years, the world believed Monopoly's creator was a man from Philadelphia, Charles Darrow, who reworked it with Atlantic City streets, cut out the second part, Prosperity, renamed it all Monopoly, and sold it to the board game maker, Parker Bros. Here's the US patent with the name of Darrow at the top. Boardwalk is the most expensive, Baltic Avenue the least. Otherwise, it's hardly changed. Elizabeth Magie lost out, and though her part was recognised much later, and she sold the Parker Brothers other games, she learned, she said, 500 bucks, that's all, from her fast-dealing property trading game. The game as marketed by Parker sold like face masks in an epidemic in those dull pre-television years when there was nothing else to do at night. It came to Britain first in 1935 when Waddington's of Leeds acquired the rights. The managing director, Victor Watson, felt it should have London streets and so one morning early with his secretary, Marge Phillips, took the Flying Scotsman to King's Cross. They hired a taxi, Marjorie and Victor, and at evening time discussed what they had learned at Lyons Corner House in Islington. Their rendezvous is on a plaque inside what's now the Co-op Bank. And there you see the plaque recording their visit in 35. And basically what happens is that we follow their tour around the board. So many of the narratives on, the, uh, on each street are as it was in 1935. They spread a map out on the tablecloth and Marjorie found some crayons in her bag. The East End, what a dump, together with the road to Kent. They'd both be brown, the colour of, well, never mind, said Marjorie. The light blues, Euston, Pentonville and Angel, were an 18th century bypass, London's first, to take the cattle herds away from Oxford Street, which had been the road to Smithfield Market before that. The purple properties are royalty and government in Whitehall, Pall Mall and Northumberland Avenue. The reds are on the Thames, the Riviera if you like, Fleet Street, Strand, Trafalgar Square, in line, the route between the monarch in the west and the merchants and the bankers in the east, or what we call the city, the original part of London, which the Romans originally walled in. That line around the words the city is roughly what the Roman wall was. Um, the orange streets, Bow, Marlborough and Vine, are law, though all the courts are gone today. The yellows, Piccadilly, Leicester Square and Coventry Street, our theatre land. The greens are shopping, Regent, Bond and Oxford Street. And dark blue is the idle rich, Park Lane and Mayfair. Players who acquire these usually win. The spots are railway stations, one of which is King's Cross, where our Waddington's employees disembarked. Let's follow them. This round of what must be the greatest ever board game now begins. You might catch up with Marjorie and Victor on the way. So then what happens, we, we go back to the board. Well, here is the board, as you can see, and we roll the dice and whichever square it lands on, then I tell you about the cultural and historical background to it. You see there are a number of players there on the right, seven of them, although you only get six in any game, but they've changed every so often. Um, and 
the the original one was the thimble, which is at the top there. It was the thimble because this was a game played in the house, a home uh, game. And so things that you might find around the house were the first objects, the iron, the flat iron, the toy ship, etc., the boot, the dog, although you probably wouldn't put your pet dog on the board. Um, now, it's there are 40 stops, as you can see, and to uh, uh, Nick, um, who is presenting this afternoon, um, is operating the board. He's uh, changing the pictures. Um, and it's much too large a file to send to him. So, in fact, this afternoon, as this is only a demonstration, I'm not going to roll any dice. We're just going to visit two, which I've picked out because of their relevance, partly to the to, um, uh, visitors on the other side of the Atlantic, North America, which is where the game originally came from anyway. So we're going to go to Regent Street and Mayfair in a minute. Well, OK, let's go there now. Regent Street. So this is what uh, the the visit, the tourists get the the players get when they arrive on Regent Street. In Regent Street, you buy Monopoly at Hamley's Toy Shop, or toy store if you are an American. The shop or store began in 1760 when the U.S. was still part of the U.K. and Mad King George the Third was crowned although he'd not let his insanity be shown as yet. It's he who lost the colonies, or some of them, in North America. That was mad. Canada, the cold bit, stayed on board. Anyway, toy story, the toy shop. No one knows too much about the founder, William Hamley, except he came from Cornwall, two days' ride away at least, to set up a, as a toy inventor manufacturer in London. And no doubt his Cornish brogue was good for business, made him seem avuncular and innocent. Hamley's toy shop came to Regent Street much later and was so successful that it soon filled seven floors with merchandise, especially children's games like this one. No one made a fuss when in the 1920s the apostrophe was dropped. It has been one of the most visited attractions that we have. Five million customers came annually through the door. No more. Pity the acquisitive concern Reliance Retail Limited, which bought the shop or store last year in time for COVID. But they'll be back. It's not as if there's damage to repair except to the economy, but no physical building damage. Regent Street itself was built as an attraction to impress the visitor. The man behind it was the Prince of Wales, the son of George III, the regent who replaced his father when the king went mad and was incapable of ruling. That's what regent means, reigning in the place of. Not that there's much that much to do as king. The regent spent his time and money on fantastic and expensive building schemes conceived by his good friend and architect John Nash. Like this here Regent Street, which started at the Palace on the Mall and ran a mile to Regent's Park, with grand imperial buildings either side and a graceful sweeping curve. Because not even he, the regent, stand in for the king, could bulldoze through the rights of other landowners. Build a hotel here, Monopolis. The street has space to stage promotions for the NFL on quiet Sundays when it's free of cars, and every year at Christmas, some celebrity will press a switch and on will come the lights like spangled webs with angels. Wings outspread, praising God and saying glory to the shopkeepers, like Hamley's, and the shoppers who will spend and spend again in the highest. So be it. And then we move on to Mayfair. And then in the game, of course, there'd be a bit of rustling about while I roll the dice, and this would be 
the movement from one street to another if the game were live and on the street. So here we are. Marjorie and Victor reach the end. They've done all their research and will head back to Leeds, where Waddington's their workplace is, and will begin to market this new game of capitalist principles among the British fans of home pursuits. The aim's to bankrupt all the other players, and the player who has Mayfair often wins. Mayfair should be last, they think, because of its high-value real estate and cachet with Americans, whose embassy was there. Grosvenor Square, there's Grosvenor Square, was the address of the American embassy, and that's the Biltmore Mayfair Hotel, which reopened 2019 with that name. It's where the Russian Litvinenko was poisoned as a traitor 15 years ago. Biltmore's about right. Biltmore Hotels recently the former embassy will be one. Yes, it's what the game's about. I haven't a picture of the former embassy. It's um, got a lot of scaffolding at it, on it, or last time I looked it had, um, because it's being converted into a, an, a, a, a five-star hotel. And the embassy has now moved down onto the uh, River Thames. It's supposed to be the greenest building in the world, the new one even has a moat around it. Uh, it's good that the moat has come back into fashion after 800 years or so. And um, very effective it is too. It's supposed to stop um, attack by uh, vehicles loaded with explosives. And of course it would stop that. Not that anyone's tried. Anyway, that's the, um, the new embassy. And Grosvenor Square was the address of the old one. A lot of people were upset about it. And I'm not surprised because the fine uh, building, which is, is becoming a hotel, was uh, one of the grandest of embassies. Now we move on. The Mayfair celebrated once the spring and all that goes with it. The optimism, rebirth and renewal. Children danced around a may maypole clutching coloured bands which plaited patterns as they interwove. Many people misbehaved, got drunk, left rubbish everywhere, annoying residents, and fairs were banned in 1764. After all, Shepherd Market, which is at the heart of Mayfair, and where the pubs and outdoor restaurants do well, is just a walk across Green Park from the King. Edward Shepherd was the builder's name. He made his fortune when the fair was gone, building for the gentry who desired spacious Grosvenor Square homes, but were not averse to discreet taverns like the grapes. Did Marjorie and Victor fall in love as they plotted the addresses for the game? We'll never know. But anyone who's played will certainly appreciate that it is much more likely to provoke a row than lead to any romance. Am I right? Rick, thank you so much. That was fantastic. What a brilliant idea for a series of tours. And well, thank you very much, Nick. So at the moment you're doing it every morning, is that right? Yes, every morning. <laughs> and um, because there have been quite a few uh, American visitors so far, um, which... And for them, it's very early, 3 a.m. Uh, I've decided to do it in the afternoon as well. So 4, 4 p.m. Theater. UK time, which is, around, well, depending on which uh, time band you're in in the States, would be 9, 10 or 11 o'clock, I suppose. Yeah, but and that's your, your website address to go to. That's my website one. address, rickjonesguide.co.uk. Yeah. In fact, one of the players was... Um, runner-up in the 2012 US uh, Monopoly Championships, Chris Schlosser. Wow. And um, he asked me if I would do it later in the day for him. So I said yes. And it, he, he was impressed with the game. He, hadn't, he didn't know the England, the British streets. He knew it only in its Atlantic City version, um, which is much more familiar uh, in the US mm -hmm. where it comes from. So... But, um, 
Yes. If you've got, if you've got any questions for Rick, then do put them in the comments now. We will try and answer some of them. Uh, just to give you some of the comments that have come in already, Rick, there's Bodle just says, can't wait to visit London again. Have to be patient. It's very interesting listening to you. And Jodie says she can't wait till she returns. Uh, Bill Overton is watching in Texas. So is he? A long way. Uh, what time is it over there? Morning. I it? would think uh, it's seven, eight, 7 or 8, isn't it? Well. Okay. Uh, Montreal, we've got uh, Ruby. Uh, we've got someone in Italy. Um, and Norway. And Tanzania. So they're all over the world. Good Black Lord. Heath, a little bit nearer. Uh, missing the hustle and bustle. Um, Eddie says, a great you idea. You missed out Bruce Jones. You didn't say Bruce Jones there, Nick. Did I not? No. <laughs> the name um, is... Uh, it's, uh, okay, okay. He's a relative. Uh, ah, okay, that'll be right. Um, <laughs> and Eddie there. And Eddie as well, you know Eddie. Yes. And, yeah, and Victoria as well. Um, so, yeah, any questions, put them in the comments. So what's your favourite? What, what um, side do you like best to talk about? You know, you're so pleased when the, the number comes up early, it's time... Um, I certainly area. like uh, doing the Old Kent Road. That's the longest one of all, and it has several panels because it's based on um, a series of uh, um, uh, ceramic tiles, huge in their mm -hmm. conception and execution on, it, on site in situ. And um, I've spread them over the, the six or seven squares that uh, they take up. And that gives the whole history of the Old Kent Road right from Roman times, because 2,000 years ago it was the access point, the access mm -hmm. point to London. Romans came along there, and they called it the Via Romana, mm -hmm. the Roman Way. And then over the years, it was also the the road that the the Canterbury pilgrims took out of London and down to um, Canterbury, and then back again, of course. It was the road that Henry V took when he went off to campaign in France to fight the Battle of um, Agincourt with the British, with the English mm -hmm. army and the cheers of the people on the way out. It was the road that rebels took um, on the way into London, Jack Cade's Rebellion, which was, uh -huh. um, uh, okay, that, that's about 100 years after the Henry V, <laughs> so it's the, the 16th, 15th century we're talking about then, or 16th. 15th 1400s and interestingly that's about tax and so two of mm. the squares as you'll know on the board are tax and the mm. whole game as i said in the introduction was a, a, a partly a, a, an instruction about tax and how tax might be differently done and so many of revolutions in this country have come about as a result of over taxation Mm -hmm. We can go back to as recently as the poll tax riots in the 1990s. Indeed. That was a direct result of people's disgruntlement at being overtaxed. But in the, the civil war in the 17th century, the 1640s, that came about because the king tried to tax the people without recourse to parliament. Mm -hmm. Money, and money is the the, end, the bottom of most of these conflicts somewhere, it, isn't it? That is true, so true. And the, it, I've, the, it comes up so often in this game that that has been mm -hmm. the case, yeah. Brilliant. Now tell me something that really intrigued me when I was um, playing this as a kid. I could never work out the railway stations, why, you know, some of the big railway stations aren't on there. The Victoria, there's no Waterloo. Um, yeah, no Paddington. So explain why the why they chose those four railway stations that they did. Well, that is also very interesting, and as you pointed out, two of them are quite obscure: Fenchurch Street and Marlebone. There, hardly anyone from outside London has even heard of them. But um, it's because Victor, Victor and Marjorie, when they came to London in thirty-five to research the game, they arrived at King's Cross Station which is the first station on the board. And then it so happened that the other three were also a part of that the same railway company, although they're not in the same part of London. The LNER, it's called, the London and North East Railway okay. Company. And they had monopolised. It's the game again. They had made created a monopoly of railway stations, that one company. 
And so those other three are the three in the franchise. And yes, also very interesting that that, that should have been the case. Liverpool yeah. Street Station in the, is, is the last one on the board mm -hmm. that was renovated in the 1990s. Fenchurch Street is it's that Fenchurch Street's interesting because it's the only location on the board that's in the old city of London. All uh, the others, they're all outside. They're all in London mm -hmm. as it expanded beyond the financial district, the the, the, the old Roman city. And Marlebone, so, an interesting little station that's that serves the tourist destinations like Stratford upon Avon mm -hmm. and Bista Village. You can get a, a direct train from Marlebone out to Bista, which is a tiny village which has become famous in recent years for being a place where particularly uh, visitors from Japan and China like to go and buy br brand name <laughs> products. Yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. I gather it is one of the most busiest places on the tourist trail. Yes, shopping it is. City. <laughs> yes, shopping city. Absolutely. So there's a few more comments Kaya, have come in. A great tour, says Victoria. Um, question uh, from Sicily, such an interesting theme. Peter um, has the story, um, this quite a famous story about the Americans um, wanting to buy the freehold of the old embassy, but they weren't. They tried to buy it from the Duke of Westminster, who owns that whole area of London, and he offered to sell them as long as they gave his family Florida back. Florida back. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, disappeared. Well, that's good. Know, I'll use that next time, so. Um, Peter. So thank you for that. <laughs> it's an interesting story. And um, uh, Marina says, great, great idea to study the history of London and it is and ev and you can come and, and do the tour several times can't you because every time you get a different tour it's a different tour each time yeah uh, unless you're very unlucky and that <laughs> could never happen but yeah you, it's different every time and it it's interesting for me to do it like that too yeah absolutely it keep, keeps your interest there so thank you so much rick um if you want to know more about Rick, or if you, you can go to his website, you can also go to our Guide London website, guidelondon.org.uk. Um, there you can find all the different tours that our guides offer. Um, a lot of them can be done virtually. So as the Monopoly tour is a virtual tour, you sit in your home and you can enjoy it from there. A lot of our tours that we do at the moment, we can do virtually. And then hopefully you'll enjoy a virtual tour. And when the pandemic is finally over, you'll come and see these wonderful places in person. And we'd love to show them to you. But if you look at the um, website, guidelondon.org.uk, you can see all the different tours listed. There's also a series of blogs so you can read about some of the history of London, um, some very interesting, fascinating information there. So that's the place to go, guidelondon.org.uk. So we'll be back at the same time next Tuesday. That's 4 p.m. UK time. Next week, we're going to be talking about Jewish London, about some of the history of Jewish London. So join us next Tuesday from, for that. But from Rick and from myself for the moment, very goodbye to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>